Here we go. <laughs> the exclusionary rule. The exclusionary rule is related to our Fourth Amendment rights, which is about search and seizure. And I'm not going to get into the whole Fourth Amendment. We could do a whole <laughs> podcast on the Fourth Amendment. We could do a whole video series. Why did anybody tell me to fix my shirt collar? Now, the exclusionary rule, it's got exceptions. It's got companion rules. It's got a poisonous tree. The Fourth Amendment was such a big deal. I'm just going to touch on this. But the Fourth Amendment was such a big deal to the framers, to our nation, to Americans at the beginning, because we had just come from a situation in Britain where there are these things called uh, general warrants or writs of assistance. These were basically loosey-goosey warrants that anybody could use to investigate the home of a political enemy or somebody they thought was. So that was a big problem. We as a new nation wanted none of that. The exclusionary rule states that evidence that was collected illegally can't be used as evidence in a court of law. Right? Let's say I was a police officer and I was investigating um, stolen tropical parrots. Somebody robbed a pet shop and stole a bunch of tropical parrots. So I'm a cop and I go into someone's house because I thought that he had stolen some exotic parrots. And I see parrots there and I take some photographs of them and I, um, you know, subsequently arrest the guy. If I didn't have a warrant and that evidence was obtained illegally because I just went in, that evidence cannot be used in court. Now, you see this as a trope in just about every TV cop show that's out there. I'm just going to mention briefly three Supreme Court cases that are relative to the exclusionary rule. There's a lot more, I know. All right, number one, Weeks versus the United States. Fremont Weeks. In 1911, Fremont Weeks got in a lot of trouble. He was uh, arrested for selling, uh, mailing lottery tickets. And uh, after he was arrested, the police, without a search warrant, went to his house and they found evidence. They found a bunch of envelopes and a bunch of lottery tickets. So it's appealed up to the Supreme Court. Weeks is arguing that was an unconstitutional search and seizure of his stuff because that, that was the evidence used after he'd been arrested. And it was a unanimous vote. That evidence should not have been presented at court because it was seized illegally. The, one of the justices who wrote the opinion, Justice Day, he had a very good quote. Um, what did he say? What did that old day say? And today on what day did say? If, so day said, if letters and private documents can be seized and held and used in evidence like that, basically, the protection of the Fourth Amendment declaring his right to be secured against such searches and seizures is of no value. We should just write it out of the Constitution entirely. Exclusionary rule is often at war with uh, lawyers and the law. And one of the famous quotes that arose of it, out of it is, the criminal goes free because of the constable's blunder. The constable is responsible. However, like what if the only protection against somebody going to your house and looking through your stuff is that they'll get a slap on the wrist and told, hey, you shouldn't do that, and you still go to jail? Wolf v. Colorado, 1949. Julius Wolf and Charles and Betty Hudden were accused of conspiring to perform an abortion. And some of the evidence collected against uh, Julius Wolf was considered inadmissible. And yet they still used it in court. And that time, strangely enough, uh, the court voted that the, uh, that the exclusionary rule is not valid. And they said it wasn't valid because it was a state thing. They said, well, federally, you can have the exclusionary rule, but individual states can uh, have different sets of rules. And in Colorado, we can admit inadmissible evidence and use it in a court of law. But it didn't last long. The landmark exclusionary rule case is from 1961, and it's definitely in every textbook that you're assigned, Map v. Ohio. Map v. Ohio is a long, winding case uh, takes place in Cleveland in 1961, and it involves Don King, and it involves a mob numbers runner, and bombs and pornography. Look at all that wrapped into one. So the police were looking for someone uh, to question about a bombing in the 1960s who did a bombing. Dalry Mapp was suspected of harboring this person in her house. So police went into her house without a warrant. She said, do you have a warrant? And they said, no. That's this thing about like they handed her a, f a piece of paper and she threw it away. To my knowledge, they did not have a warrant. They went in 
They searched the house top to bottom. They went into the basement. They did not find the person they were trying to uh, question. But they did find a box of pornography and a gun. Dalry Mapp said those were from a previous tenant and she just put them in a box and put them down there. A year later, a year later, she is in court for uh, having obscene material. Should that be used in evidence in, in the court? Because they didn't enter the house with a legal search warrant. They weren't entering it to find uh, evidence of pornography. And this was a reversal of Wolfie, Colorado. So they, they overturned. Wolfie, Colorado, and it involves the 14th Amendment as well. I sent my sister, my sister's a lawyer, and I sent her a text being like, hey, can you like tell me a little bit about the 14th Amendment, maybe how it relates to uh, Map v. Ohio? And she was like, ha! How much time have you got? Go to law school, kid. Oh, there's a fun doctrine attached to the exclusionary rule, and it's called fruit of a poisonous tree. Sounds like the apple of knowledge. Did you know it wasn't an apple? I think people say it was a pomegranate, but it definitely wasn't an apple. So the fruit from a poisonous tree doctrine related to the exclusionary rule is that evidence that's gathered subsequent to illegal evidence that's gathered is also inadmissible. Let me give you an example. Uh, Let's say I rob a bank. No, that's not going to work, is it? Let's say I steal an exotic parrot. And the police come to my house and they illegally search it and they find evidence of a parrot. And then they come to me and they say, we have all the evidence uh, of you. uh, We have the evidence to put you in the can, buddy, for stealing all those parrots illegally. And I say, "Okay, I did it. You cop. You got me. It's a fair cop. You know, you got me. And I give a full confession. But if the parrot evidence was gathered illegally then my confession is also thrown out. That can also not be used as evidence because it's fruit from a poisonous tree. You take one bite out of that apple, rotten to the core. And there's some exceptions to the exclusionary rule, and here they are. So for the purposes of demonstration of these six times that you don't need to use a warrant, I'm going to be using my friend and colleague, Ben Henry. Can I come in and look around? Sure. Oh, rookie mistake. That's called consent. Because Ben let me into his house, anything I see in it I can use as admissible evidence. Number two is called plain view. If I'm walking by Ben's house and I see a parrot in the window, I can go in and search it. But it doesn't stop there. What do you want? Can I come in and look around? You have a warrant? I'm a bird. Stolen bird. That's right. Plain view also applies to sounds and even smells. Do you have a dangerous weapon in your pocket? I'm going to have to check you for that. Frisking. Oh, frisking is so complicated. I can only frisk Ben if I have a reasonable suspicion that he is concealing a weapon of some kind. And then, once I find that, I can frisk him for contraband. I cannot frisk him for a parrot. No siree. A knife. Uh. (laughs) What's this? What do you want? Mr. Henry, I have a warrant for your arrest. All right. All right. Wait a minute. If I lawfully arrest somebody, anything in their wingspan is admissible as evidence. That includes stuff on his person. This is basically to, you know, stop someone from throwing away evidence or setting off a bomb or something like that. You, hold it right there. I am in pursuit. And now I can open this door. So if I'm in pursuit of a suspect and he's running away from me and he goes inside a house, I can follow him in there. This is one of the reasons why you'll hear in shows, I am in pursuit. Good evening, sir. This isn't going to go well, is it? (laughs) Oh, no, Ben. It's not going to go well for you at all. And that's because you're in a car. This is called the automobile exception, and this is because vehicles are highly mobile. If I have probable cause that there's something parrotish in that car, I can search it. I do not need to go to a judge for a warrant. Theoretically, someone in a car could drive away real fast to get rid of evidence or drive to another country or do whatever. Thanks, Ben. You are just the greatest. Yeah, so that's the exclusionary rule. Don't use evidence that was collected illegally. Could have done it in 
six seconds. But I don't know. What do you think? Do you like it? Should we change it? Feel free to let me know. We're really in an age of questioning um, what's private and what's not, aren't we? In terms of the internet and our phones. I'll leave that to the brighter minds of the generation. Of the generations to come. Well, that's about it for this explainer. Thanks, Ben. You did real good, Ben Henry. And uh, keep being civil and don't be exclusionary. <laughs>